Hey everybody, thanks for tuning in. I'm Zach Peterson. I'm a technical consultant with Altium. And today we're gonna talk a little bit more about routing high speed on a two layer board. And specifically, we're gonna look at an example with USB. USB is a real simple protocol to work with. It has a real simple layout, has some pretty simple routing rules. And so we're gonna look at all that stuff today. Let's get into it. previous video where we looked at high speed routing on a two layer board and some of the initial considerations that you need to think about as you're preparing your high speed routing on a two layer board, we looked at a specific example that involved a 500 picosecond rise time digital signal and what its critical length should be. What we found was that in a pretty conservative limit, we found that a half inch critical length was about the longest trace length you should have before you start need to start worrying about controlled impedance. Well, I looked at that specific specific example because that is the rise time in the USB 2 specification for the high speed generation. And so that's the example that we want to look at today. What we're going to do is we're going to do a few things. First, how do you even design the traces to make sure that you have controlled impedance? Where is your host going to go or your host processor, I should say, going to go? What does the routing topology look like? And then how do you actually get to that impedance target? Generally, if you're going to do a board where you have to have something like USB, you've probably got your host processor right here. Maybe it's an MCU with a USB interface. And somewhere on the edge, you've got your connector. And so you have to route somewhere on the board in order to get your traces from the MCU over to the connector. Generally, if you're going to do this, the best way to orient the MCU is so that the USB interface is on this side facing the connector. This is actually one of those really basic things about layout with high speed devices is you should lay out or orient the devices such that, you know, if you got USB interfaces on this side of the component, you put the USB stuff over here. Maybe you've got like DDR or something over on this side of the component. The DDR stuff should go over here and so on and so forth. And so you're going to have to get the traces over to here. So you've got a D plus and a D minus signal. So these are the two sides of your differential pair that is going to carry your signal or your data over here to the connector. Now there's also a ground connection and then there's also a power connection. And all four of these are going to feed over a standard USB cable that uses USB 2.0. That will eventually be received at the other device, which is your peripheral device. And that device is then going to receive all four of these signals. These are going to get routed into the peripheral device and then get read out. And then the peripheral is going to do its thing. So here, the first challenge is we have some impedance Z0 and ZD differential. So we have a characteristic slash odd impedance. Remember if from our previous uh, discussion on differential impedance that we don't actually care about the characteristic impedance. We really care about the odd impedance. That's the impedance of just this individual trace. And then we have a differential impedance. Usually when I start discussing this with people, people bring up, well, you know, you only care about the odd impedance and that's what you have to design to. And I mean, technically they are correct in this case with USB. The differential impedance is essentially like a mathematical shortcut to the odd impedance. So if you're using your layer stack manager in Altium Designer, maybe you're using another program to determine the differential impedance and to design the, uh, the spacing and the width, this is usually what you're gonna design to is the differential impedance spec. And then you can use that, divide it by two, that gives you your odd impedance spec. So what's actually happening with this route? Remember, you have a connector connected to this connector is a cable and the cable has some defined impedance. We're just going to call it uh, Z sub C and you need to have some matching between the trace impedance and then the connector plus the cable impedance. And then same thing down here at this end where your peripheral is. Eventually, this will then need to also match to the connector and then the traces going into whatever the peripheral uh, controller is. So that's everything that's going on along this entire route. And now your job as the PCB designer is to design 
to the odd or differential mode specification, as well as to include some pull up or pull down resistors, depending on the generation of USB 2 that you're working with. So the pull up and pull down resistors need to be placed based on which generation of USB 2 you're working with. So here, so far, where we're talking about 500 picosecond rise time, we're dealing with the high speed specification. There are two other specifications. There's also low speed, which has the lowest rise time and data rate. And then there's also a full speed, which has kind of the mid range rise time and data rate. So here with full speed, the specification is four to 20 nanoseconds for the rise time. So immediately what you should see here is that for high speed versus full speed, it's gonna be a lot easier to design this whole thing and violate these impedance constraints if you're only designing to the full speed spec versus the high speed spec. So another important point that we kind of alluded to in the previous video when we were talking about sizing traces so that they can work on a two layer board is how wide do they need to be? How much spacing do you need between differential pairs? What board thickness are you working with? So that's another important point. And there was actually a question on the previous YouTube video on high-speed routing on the two-layer board. And we wanna look at that right now. Christopher Matthews writes, haven't stopped to do the trace width calculation, but using an eight millimeter thick two-layer board would make the trace widths more manageable. Surely this would be better than the usual 1.6 millimeter board. So Christopher is exactly right. It is easier to work with traces that are on a 0.8 millimeter board or a one millimeter board than it is to work with the full 1.6 millimeter board. So I brought up the 1.6 millimeters because it is kind of the standard PCB thickness that you'll generally work with. However, there are standard stack ups and material compositions and everything that are on a 0.8 or a one millimeter board. So that's one of those things, if you're gonna do this type of system where you're doing high speed routing on, on a two layer board, just talk to your fabricator, ask them what thicknesses they can do. If you wanna do this on a one millimeter board, you totally can. So here's how this is gonna affect the impedance. So if you remember from the previous video, when we're looking at our stack up, what we said we wanted to do was put ground plane down here, or at least, you know, ground pour that spans underneath the trace far enough. And then we've got our trace up here. So what we found was that if this is something like 1.6 millimeter height or about 62 mils, I'll work in mils. Here we found that this trace width was like, you know, 105 or 110 mils, depending on the DK value of your dielectric. If you just want to start putting a single trace up here as part of your USB route on a 62 mil thick board above a ground plane, this is really wide. That's a 10th of an inch. So how do we overcome that? We can't just take the board, I'll draw out the top view here, and have our MCU here, and then route one of these things up like this, and then the other one over around like this, and then you know eventually get to our connector and then expect everything to work because we're gonna have a bunch of impedance mismatches along this route. Let's just say this is gonna be a 10 mil wide trace. This is actually gonna be a really high impedance. And then same thing over here, we'd have really high impedance for this trace. And so if we wanted to work with the high speed spec, we'd have a big impedance mismatch here at this connector. And so as a result, we'd have a lot of reflections and it's unlikely that the channel would work. This would ideally be our odd impedance instead of the characteristic impedance. So remember, this is the value for a characteristic impedance of 50 ohms. Now, what we actually need to do is we need to do a uh, differential impedance of 90 ohms. So this is the spec that we want to meet. Now, if we had a differential impedance of 90 ohms and we try to draw uh, to design the odd mode impedance to be 45 ohms in this arrangement where we just have a single trace routing along by itself as part of the differential pair, what would happen? Well, it would still be a really big trace. So this isn't going to work. So we've got two options here to try and figure out how we're going to route our board. Either we need to fill in everything with ground so that we create some parasitic capacitance. 
That then lowers the impedance of this trace for a given width. And then we would do the same thing over here and the same thing everywhere else. So we try and create a coplanar arrangement, but this is really messy. In this case, what we should do, and what I would recommend you do, is you instead route the traces very close together because this coupling between them is now going to cause the trace width that you need to hit a Z odd of 45 ohms, as well as a Z differential of 90 ohms to be much more manageable. So it's gonna be somewhere in the neighborhood of about 15 mil trace width with about a five mil spacing. And so that's basically how you're gonna to have to size your traces is to bring them close together and allow the natural coupling between their parasitic capacitance and their mutual inductance to lower the impedance and therefore cause you to actually hit the impedance spec with a manageable trace width. So this essentially just comes from the fact that when I bring in another trace, they start to couple to each other through the electric field. All right, so if this is my ground region below my two traces, and I bring in trace number one, as soon as I bring in trace number two, the two traces are going to have some electric field coupling between them. So this is just the electric field. Now this is basically my plus side, this is my minus side, so that means this is my D plus line, this is my D minus line, and it's this coupling between them that is going to really dominate the determination of impedance. So because this ground plane is so far away, there's actually gonna be really weak coupling to the ground plane. And so that's why if I take this trace and I move it really far away, meaning it practically doesn't exist from the view of this trace, this trace will then have very high impedance because I have very weak coupling back here to the ground plane. You're actually gonna have most of your coupling over here to this D minus line. And that explains why we need to actually have the two either close together or we just need to fill in a bunch of ground around these two. And so now what I wanna do before we actually finish designing the rest of this route is actually show you an example in Altium Designer that shows that you can actually do either of these. You can do the two traces close together or you can put them close together and bring in some external ground pour. And if you bring in some external ground pour, that's also going to modify the trace width that you need in order to hit the differential impedance spec. So let's go ahead and look at that right now. So the first thing I wanna to do to try and figure out the uh, trace impedance that we're gonna need is I just wanna use Altium Designer to uh, create a uh, impedance profile. Now that impedance profile is what's gonna allow us to actually set a design rule based on what we calculate for the impedance. So it's gonna enforce the trace spacing and it's gonna enforce the trace width. So what I'm gonna do is just open up the layer stack manager. So first things first, you'll see the default dielectric thickness for a two layer PCB is only 12.6 mils. Let's just for the moment make it 62 mils. And actually we'd wanna make it about 60 mils since we have one ounce copper weight here. So let's just go ahead and make it 60 mils. That makes our overall board size uh, just a little over 63 mils. So that's fine. So we got 60 mil thickness. And what I wanna do is go down here to the very bottom and click on the impedance profile tab. I'm just gonna add an impedance profile. And so immediately what you can see here is to hit a 50 ohm Im impedance, you would have 105.5 mil wide traces. So huge traces, obviously, as I mentioned before, we don't really want that. So there are a couple of ways to approach this. And so first what I wanna do is go over here to the Atmel USB design guidelines. I think this is a, one of those uh, starting points that a lot of people use to start looking at high speed USB trace routing and trace design. And so what they're telling you to do is to determine the width such that you get a individual trace impedance of 50 ohms. You can see they have a typo here in their document. They've written 50 W. They actually meant to write 50 with the omega symbol, so 50 ohms. And then get the S value so that you get a differential impedance of 90 ohms. The, the reality is that the 50 ohm single-ended portion only matters if you're gonna actually route everything as a single-ended trace. So that's really important. So remember earlier when I said, when we were looking at the whiteboard, that if you wanna route a single-ended trace, you have to fill in a bunch of ground in order to get to the uh, a manageable trace width to get to a 50 ohm trace. That's essentially what you would have to do. Frankly, in this case, it's a lot easier to just keep the lines close 
And then what you're gonna have is you won't actually have a 50 ohm trace, you'll have a 45 ohm trace due to the coupling between the two traces. So let's just look really quick at what would happen if instead of just having a individual trace routed over ground with nothing around it, so no ground pour on the signal layer, what would happen if we change this to a single coplanar, okay? And we enforce five mil clearance. So what we immediately see is now the width is a lot more manageable. It's actually 20.256 mils. Pretty good. Let's say we went down to a one millimeter board. So we had 38 mil thickness and we're just, we're just slightly over one millimeter on this uh, core thickness. Even then, we only get down to a 19.458 mil width on our traces. Okay, so it barely changed at all. Had practically nothing. Let me just switch back to a 62 mil board real quick. So just for comparison, I mean, it was like about a mil change in the trace width that you needed. So in this case, you would have to get the board really thin in order to start seeing an effect from the ground plane on the actual trace width that you're gonna need in routing, assuming you're working with the high speed specification. The other option, if you look here where my mouse is, you'd have to change the clearance. But at five mils, you're already getting close to the required clearance that you need to maintain in order for, to ensure manufacturability. So just to kind of make the point, I could go down to one mil, but no one's gonna be able to manufacture down to one mil clearance. That will uh, unfortunately be uh, so small that the, the device would short. Three mil clearance, that's really right at the edge. And you can see you get down to about, you know, 10 and a half mil wide trace. So hopefully that, that kind of illustrates the point here that, you know, even just with ground on the top layer, trying to hit to a differential impedance spec, even with just ground on the top layer, you're still gonna have really wide traces when you're on a two layer board. So this is why it's gonna be better to just do it as a differential pair on a two layer board and bring the traces closer together because you're gonna get thinner traces. They're gonna be easier to work with. Then once you go a step further and add the ground in around the differential traces, now you're gonna get them even smaller and they're gonna be even more manageable, but they're not gonna be so small that you can't manufacture them. So let's look at that right now. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna add in another impedance profile. I'm just gonna set it up as a differential impedance profile. And setting it up as a differential impedance profile with a target of 90 ohms, we can see right here that the width is 15.967 mils. So that's even more manageable. We went from 20 down to 16 mils. And this is still with a nice easy trace gap of five mils pretty standard. So now what happens if I add in the ground pour around my differential route? Well now, if I turn this into a differential coplanar line, what I'm doing is I'm now adding in some ground around the, the two traces and it has an enforced clearance of five mil and then we have an enforced trace gap of five mils. And now you can see the width gets down to 9.467 mils. That's really nice, okay? So that's our 10 mil wide trace. That's a really nice, easy trace to work with. It's not too big, it's not too small. Pretty much every manufacturer on the planet is gonna be able to fabricate that reliably, as well as the five mil gap around your traces. So this is a really good way to route the board. And it's essentially what you'll see if you look at a lot of microcontroller boards that are done on two layers. They take the two traces, they bring them close together so that it sets the differential impedance. Then they pour in the ground around it. Pouring in the ground around it is gonna set that differential impedance to a smaller value for a smaller trace and that's what's going to allow you to, to really have a manageable route here in this type of board. So the last thing that we wanna look at here is just what happens with the topology. So I mentioned before we have some pull up and pull down resistors. So that's what we're looking at right here is just uh, those uh, pull down resistors for the high speed uh, topology. You'll notice here we have a type A and we have a type B connector at, in this link. And then you can see where the uh, the series and the, uh, the pull up resistors are, are located. Located. So these series resistors may or may not be needed. Just make sure you take, check the data sheets for your com components. But these uh, different resistors for pull up or pull down, depending on your on your generation of USB, are going to be specified in the standard. So again, just make sure to review that in your data sheets, and you'll see a good guide on what you need to do to make sure that you can hit the differential impedance requirements as well as 
balancing the need for those pull up or pull down resistors. So these, these series resistors here are, those can be 22 ohms, 45 ohms, they can be different values. It just depends on the output impedance from the host and the peripheral controller interface. But again, data sheets will tell you what you should use. Just make sure to check that. From here, you should have everything that you need to be able to build your schematics and then import all your components into your PCB layout. And then once you create this impedance profile and enforce it as a design rule on those nets for your USB link, you're ready to go, start routing. Hopefully this shows you what you need to do in order to start designing a USB 2.0 channel to run at full speed on a two layer board. Now, hopefully the takeaway you might have noticed is this, it's actually gonna be easier to do it on a four layer board, but you can certainly do it on a two layer board if you design your routes correctly. Make sure that you don't forget those pull up or pull down resistors, depending on the generation of USB you're working with. That's gonna determine that whether or not the device can actually detect that another device is plugged into the connector, and then the route can actually start operating properly. All right, everybody, if you like this video, hit that like button, hit that subscribe button, leave your questions and comments as always in the comments section. We love getting your questions and we will do our best to hit those in our next Q&A session, which we have coming up very soon. All right, everybody, thanks for watching and don't forget to call your fabricator.